Here's a quick tip we're about six years late getting to. You'll see why in a moment. This person says, I've been hearing a lot of talk lately about robotment. Will you do a quick tip explaining what robotment is and why it's important? Um, well, in, in our very, very early days, about six years ago or so, we did a quick tip, 56 if you want to watch it again, on how to create a robotment viewfinder. Well, maybe it's about time for us to learn about robotment. When we're painting, there are really only three things we need to know. One, we need to know where, where to place the images. We need to know how. We need to know the, the techniques for doing the uh, painting, all the painting techniques and the composing techniques uh, for creating that image after we place it. And we need to know why. Why do we care enough to do it to begin with? Well, this is about where. Robotmud is, uh, dates back all the way to when the golden mean or the golden rectangle was discovered. It's about that square or one of those squares that lives inside of every rectangle. The, uh, the, the concept of Robotmud has gone through several pronounce, uh, pronunciations of several spellings. Robotmud, 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 and you can Google it and find all the others too. Uh, but we'll stick to the most current spelling and pronunciation, robotment. Um, the, the concept has been used for a long, long time. Here's the way it works. Let me just take this away for a moment. So every rectangle, if it's a horizontal rectangle, the square, there's going to be a square on either end, a square that's locatable. So we see the square here on the right and the square here on the left. That division between the square and the rectangle is the robotment. And uh, you'll notice that any rectangle, any, any uh, proportion of rectangle is going to have that. Some rectangles are going to have uh, more of an obvious uh, division if they're very, very long like that. But the traditional rectangles are usually what we're working with. Um, and then if they're vertical, the robotment is either going to be on the lower half or the upper half. So. I think it might be good for us to, um, or a good way to understand how a robot is used, to look at how artists have used this in the past. I always like to go back to master artists. What have they done with a concept in order to learn it? Now, um, we all know Rembrandt. Sometimes artists play with robot in funny ways. Sometimes they'll they'll play with it about uh, uh, on both sides, with the square on both sides, and sometimes it may be on one side. But what it does. It locates either a focal point on the robotment itself, and then there'll be something going on on either side of that. Now, there are actually some compositions that will have that robotment as a division of space, where there'll be maybe a major kind of activity going on one side, and then an, maybe an answer to that on the other side of the robotment. So we also can use it as a, uh, those of you who've studied balance with me know that um, one of the really important things about balance is finding the axis. We did, we talked about this in one of our chats, our YouTube chats. And so the robotment can actually be the place where that axis is placed. So it can serve lots of things and artists play with that, which is one of the fun things about painting. You can play with these composing things and watch what they can do for your painting. Well, you can use um, something like this, or you can use, uh, go back to my little Quick Tip 56 and see how you can make yourself a robotment viewfinder. You can use one of those. You just need to be able to locate the square. So the way you locate the square, if you use one of these, I think this is called protractor, I'm not really sure, is that you can uh, align on the short side of the rectangle, and then you come here, and they find the robotment on this side is right where Rembrandt has placed the edge of that. Is that a door? Yeah, uh, actually it's a bend in a wall, isn't it? And I think there's a, probably, there's a door right here. But you see he's done that, but look what else he's done. Go on this side, he's placed, uh, this is a self-portrait of him painting, uh, he's placed himself right on that robotment edge right here. So see, he's placed with 
played with the rebondment in two ways there, making important divisions of the painting space on the rebondment line. Um, so there's one example. Let me show you some other examples of what artists have done with rebondment. So this is one I've always found really fascinating. This is the watercolor painter Mary White. And you can see what she's done here. So once again, we will, allow, we will find the, uh, find the rebondment by finding the short side of the rectangle. And we see what she's done right here is she's aligned the edge of this window and the woman's, the back of the woman's head, right going through the woman, that placement on the rebondment so that we see the woman facing this side with the window and so on, and then the woman's hair sweeping on the other side of the rebondment. A beautiful division of space there that Mary White's done. Now, you, this is a good way to look at artists' works, not just look at them and ooh and ah over them, that doesn't teach you anything, but looking at them according to how they actually used various composing ideas to put that painting together and make it um, make it so that you are intrigued by it. So let's look at um, some other possibilities here. So this is my guy, Richard Schmidt, and so many other people's guy too. Richard does wonderful, he does these things intuitively. And that's the other question people are going to ask me, do artists do this on purpose? Some do, some do it intuitively. We have this intuitive ability for see, feeling feeling how space needs to be divided in order to make it um, to make it have an intrigue uh, for the whatever's going on inside the space. So this is Richards. I want you to watch what he's done here. Now once again we will we will find the rebondment so I'll line my little pointers here on the edge. Alrighty look here right there the split of the tree right down through the rebondment. And you can see this sort of this is sort of telling one side of the tree story in the square of the rebondment, and the other side of the tree story uh, in the rectangle of the rebondment. I may be stretching it a little bit, but that's what it says to me. It might say something different to you, but the point is it feels perfectly balanced by having the tree. It also the tree also at, uh, plays the role of an axis in the balancing of the composition. Remember I said that we can use rebondment in several ways. And so he's used it in uh, in, 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 pl in placing our feel the feeling of an axis there, but we also feel the, the story part, that part of the tree is split and part is uh, reaching out into this space, the other parts are reaching into this space, and the space into the shadow portion, this space into the light portion. So that's what Richard Schmidt has done with rebondment. Now we can, this is uh, kind of interesting, but it can show you that rebondment can be used with any kind of subject. Um, this is Carolyn Anderson. And uh, let's look at, this is the vertical, a vertical use of rebondment. Now when you're doing portrait painting or paintings of animals or anything where you've got, um, you're representing more than just a scene, but you're representing a personality or two of sorts. Um, rebondment is a wonderful way to, to, to put that together. Finding creative ways to place your images so that rebondment of the image plays a role. So let's take the, let's find the square here and it's sort of like that. Now, when I, when I, you see this is placed so that the mother's eyes looking down at the baby is right on the rebondment. The, the baby itself is in the square of the rebondment and the mother's eyes looking at the baby and then we see the rest of the, the story at the top. So those are some examples that would be interesting for you to go and look at various artists, uh, uh, artists master artists, artists who have uh, they've got the experience and the training to know how to use these things and look at their work in terms of how they've composed it. And I think to look at look for that rebondment and see if the art, now it's not necessary to always use the rebondment that way, but you'll be surprised at how many artists have used the rebondment in order to compose their paintings. Be sure to view all of our quick tips. And while you're doing so, subscribe to the channel, 
click on the bell so you'll always get a notice when we produce a new quick tip which is every week and if you have a question leave it in the comments section and we'll make a quick tip for you also take a trip over to dynamize.com where I have full length lessons downloads DVDs lots of other stuff there some free stuff for you and while you're there you can subscribe to the newsletter and that way you'll always be informed every time we do something new